Okay, let me get a sip of water. This is, I'm going to start with um, notebook, notebook two, uh, topic modeling with NMF and SVD. Uh, so topic modeling, uh, we're going to use two popular matrix decomposition techniques here. Uh, but the idea is that you have a collection of documents or a collection of text. Um, and so here, this is an example showing some of the plays of Shakespeare. And you'll represent them as bags of words, uh, just kind of taking the word count of different words. So here, um, Anthony appears a lot in Anthony and Cleopatra, but not in The Tempest or Hamlet. Uh, let's see. Mercy, uh, the word mercy is in Hamlet. Um, and so this is a way that you can kind of hear you're representing the, the plays of Shakespeare as a matrix. Um, and the idea behind matrix decomposition is taking one matrix and representing it as a few matrices. Um, and the ones we'll be looking at, these will be matrix products. So we'll take one matrix and decompose it into a few things uh, that multiplied together give you your original matrix. And the reason this is useful is the factors that you're decomposing into have special properties that are nicer than your original matrix. Um, and this is also sometimes called latent semantic analysis, um, LSA. And so uh, kind of as a motivation, I give a, a case where what if you wanted to represent uh, this matrix we have of the, and this is called the term document, uh, term document matrix, because here are the terms, these are the different documents. Um, if you were going to represent that just as uh, an outer product of two vectors, you're not going to do a great job, um, but one kind of probably the best you could do would be to have one vector be the relative frequency of each vocabulary word out of the total word count, and the other to have the average number of words per document um, and that would give you as close as you could get, uh, kind of taking information in. We'll, we'll do this then with, you know, multiple columns and multiple rows. And we can think about creating clusters of the, of the documents. Um, and so that's what, that's what's going to be happening, um, where the different, the different clusters of documents or groups. So let me start running running these. So here we'll be using Scikit-Learn and the 20 news groups data set, which is available in Scikit-Learn data sets. Uh, yeah. Uh, Scikit-Learn.datasets is kind of a nice, I think, collection of data sets that you can get kind of that come with Scikit-Learn. So news groups were discuss discussion groups on Usenet, which was popular in the 80s and 90s. Um, and this is kind of, if you hear about like bulletin boards um, from the earlier days of the web. <coughs> um, this data set includes 18,000 news groups posts with 20 topics. Um, and then I link to uh, some more tutorials on this. I really like, there's a text analysis with topic models for the humanities and social sciences using a British literature data set, uh, which I'll show a tiny bit of uh, later. So getting into this, we're gonna, um, we're just gonna pick out four categories. So we're, so topic modeling is a unsupervised problem and that you don't know what the right answer is of, you know, like what are the best topics for your, your group of documents. That's not, uh, not something where you have a set of answers. And so to make this clearer to us, if whether or not we're doing a good job, we're just going to pick out uh, four topics and then not use that information though in our matrix decomposition and see how close what we get it comes to that. So here I've picked out atheism, religion, computer graphics, and space. It's always nice to just check the, the shape of your data. So here, uh, this is uh, 2034. Those are the different posts. Uh, let's look at kind of what this looks like. So here I've just picked out one message. 
Hi, I've noticed that if you only save a model with all your mapping planes positioned carefully to a 3DS file, that when you reload it after restarting. Um, so what, uh, what topic do you think this first message is? Computer graphics, yes. Um, then the next one, and so here I was um, outputting the first, uh, just the first four um, text. We've got a seems to be barring evidence to the contrary that Koresh was simply another deranged fanatic. Um, what uh, what topic do we think this is? Yeah, probably religion. Um, and so this is, uh, if you remember, this is a cult in Waco. Um, I guess it was set in the 90s. Um, here's one. Let me see. So the figure seems unlikely to actually be anything but a perijove. Um, I had to look this up. Uh, perijove is the point in the orbit of a satellite of Jupiter nearest the planet's center. <laughs> so guesses about what that, that topic is? Space. Yeah, so that's space. Um, and so, and then you can see that here when I check, yes, they were graphics, uh, religion, and space. And it's always good to look at your data just to get a sense of what, is this, what does this look like. Uh, the target attribute um, is the index of the category. So these are our um, labels or our Ys, uh, depending on how you, how you refer to this. And so then um, something about uh, these matrix decompositions, and really I think uh, most clustering analysis, is you have to choose how many topics you want to create. Um, and so that's something here. I've said six uh, to see what I get. But you could try running this with different numbers of topics. Because, um, you, you know, you think about, like, if you're looking for clusters in a group, you don't know how many there truly are. Um, and that they're often, I mean, there is no true, there is no ground truth here. This is an unsupervised uh, data set. So now I want to do a, kind of a little aside about stop words stemming and lemmatization, because um, this is something uh, you hear about a lot when talking to people about NLP um, as kind of what you need to do as part of your data processing. So from... Um, the Christopher Manning intro to information retrieval, some extremely common words uh, which would be of little use in helping select documents, match a user um, need, are excluded from the vocabulary entirely. These are called stop words. This actually, I saw a tweet of it's like bad, bad map graphics, and it said most popular word by state, and it was a map of the U.S. and every state had the word the written on it. <laughs> um, so the is a is a stop word, and you could say, okay, there's not that much information that people are using the word the a lot. It's it's popular. Um, and then here, uh, the information retrieval book uh, does note that the, the general trend in information retrieval si systems over time has been from standard use of quite large stop lists, uh, 200 to 300 terms, to very small stop lists, to no stop list whatsoever. And web search engines generally do not use stop list. Um, so they are, they are falling out of favor. Uh, but I wanted to, we're going to use one here since this is a pretty small data set and we're using a simple model. <coughs> so from scikit-learn, uh, feature extraction, you can import stop words. Um, here I've just listed what the first 20 are. Um, so this is a longer list, uh, but it has uh, these words that were thought to not have, not have much uh, meaning, uh, particularly something for here where we're talking about topics. You know, these words would be more useful if we were doing language modeling um, where you actually, actually need them. Want to note that there's no single universal list of stop words. So uh, this really kind of <laughs> depends on what library you're using, what they've included as the stop words. Or you could create your own list of stop words. So pause. Any question about stop words? Why are they sort of going out of style? Um, I think so. I think a lot of it is uh, around neural networks can handle a lot more complexity, and I think it's if you had a simple model, you know, you, you didn't really have enough complexity to learn about um, these kind of minor words when you probably wanted to learn about the more uh, 
meaning, meaningful and rich words. Any other questions? Oh, and I, I forgot to do it that time. I'm going to um, throw the catch box to, which has a microphone, just so I can get that, your questions in the recording. Uh, but that, that question was, uh, why are stop words going out of style? Okay, next up is stemming and lemmatization. Um, so are the below words the same? Organize, organizes and organizing, democracy, democratic and democ uh, democratiza democratization. <laughs> um, stemming and lemmatization are both uh, ways to get to kind of the root form of the words. Lemmatization uses rules about a language and the resulting tokens are all actual words. Um, quote, stemming is the poor man's lemmatization, and that's where you kind of just chop the, the end off the word. It's a crude hur heuristic, um, but it is, it is faster, is a benefit of stemming. And so here I illustrate uh, this using NLTK. And this also, some of these I was just curious of how it would do it. Um, and there's not a there's not a canonical like this is what the stems have to be or this is what the lemmatization has to result in. It's going to depend on the implementation. Uh, I looked at feet, foot, foots, and footing. And here for lemmatization, the first three all went to foot. Uh, the last one went to footing. For the stemming, it went to the first one went to feet, and the last three went to foot. Um, and so this is uh, something you can kind of think about with, if you're doing a simple uh, simple application, do you want to have uh, group together these kind of related related words? Oh, and so now, um, now I want you to take a few, I'll give you a few minutes, uh, maybe longer, to try lemmatizing and stemming the follow following collections of words, fly, flies, flying, Organize, organizes, organizing, and universe and university. So let's take just five or ten minutes. We'll see kind of how long it takes. Um, let me know if you have any problems kind of getting your, your notebook running or, or set up. And if you missed it earlier, the GitHub repo is fastai. Let me see if there's a board. Oh, so I'll just write it down here. Um, so it's uh, GitHub, fastai, and then course dash NLP. Back up. <laughs> Um, and so, did you see anything interesting with the lemmatizing and stemming, um, the collection collection of words? Yes, and let me throw. So, ready? Okay. Um, yeah. So. When looking and at some, sorry, hold it a little bit closer. <laughs> yeah. When looking at some of the stemming results, uh, it resulted in words that are that have completely different meanings than the original words. So, like for for organize, organizes, organizing, it all stemmed it to organ, which is mm. very different than those three words. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah. So those all ended up with organ. I didn't have organ in there, but if you did, yeah, that's a very different meaning. Oh, and Jeremy's come to. <laughs> I say in the future, not directly over the <laughs> the computer setup. <laughs> um, but does anyone want to say um, about any of the other ones? Anyone? Uh, <laughs> what did you see with universe and university? <laughs> Sorry, it's a little bit no short. <laughs> uh, universe without the E. 
Yeah, so those both go to the same word. So that's another example of this, uh, those getting mapped to something universe and university have different meanings, but are going to the same word. <laughs> Do you want to toss it back? Well, thank you. Nice. <laughs> All right. Um, so I also wanted to note that stemming and lemmatization are they're language dependent. Um, languages with more complex morphologies can show bigger benefits. Um, for example, I read that Sanskrit has a very large number of verb forms. Um, and actually, does anyone here know Sanskrit? Um, do you want to do you want to say anything about it or? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so this is they showed. Um, I read this a few places, and, and there are other. Um, there are other. There are other morphology um, intense languages too. But anyway, you so see, you can get down here to like. Uh, there's singular, plural, and dual, and um, present, imperfect, optative, imperative. Um, as I was reading one estimate that said this can be. Yeah, like hundreds of uh, ways to to modify a verb, and you know, and I guess I shouldn't make a statement about uh, every language. Languages have different ways of dealing with, uh, yeah, how they how to how they modify verbs, what the different yeah things they take into account are. And this is a this is a really uh, kind of interesting topic. Um, so I just wanted to say, if you are working with different languages, this is something that could be more or less useful depending on the properties um, of the of the language you're working with. This could also, I would say, would uh, potentially be an interesting blog post topic for anybody in the course that does uh, does know a second language. Um, I feel like there's a lot, a lot to be to be said there, um, depending, I guess, depending on what the language is, uh, but about some of the the linguistic properties. Um, so, stemming and lemmatization are implement implementation dependent. Um, so, I tried running uh, running some of these with spacey now um, and and we won't uh, we won't be using this in the um, kind of in the course but if you wanted to to try it out um, it's interesting so here I lemmatized the the same set of words from before um, was it feet foot foots and footing and they all they all ended up the same. I also thought it was interesting Spacey doesn't offer a stemmer because it doesn't think you should be stemming. Um, so that's, a, that's an example of, uh, of being opinionated. And I use this to, to illustrate how stop words vary from library to library. And you can see that the Spacey stop words for English are different than scikit-learn stop words from English. And so uh, whoops, sorry, that's the answer. Uh, another exercise uh, for you to try is what stop words appear in Spacey but not in sklearn. So just take a few minutes to, to compute that. And then um, as well as the, the reverse, what stop, what's, stop words are in scikit-learn but not in Spacey. Seth? <laughs> Um, so some interesting ones um, that are in scikit-learn but not spacey are like fire, cry, mill, just some, I don't know, some words I wouldn't mm, Yeah. are stop words. Uh, but it looks like spacey has a lot of um, like conjunctions or apostrophes. Or I got those, I don't know. There's something different or updated. Oh, okay. But I got like apostrophe D, apostrophe L, L, things like that. Okay, that's, well. <laughs> so I got this list for spacey but not scikit learn. Huh, okay. Yeah, this, uh, <laughs> I don't know, we can yeah, look into it uh, later, although the, the point I was trying to illustrate, yeah, is that these are not uh, consistent or standard, so that, that still fits with that. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and so I just I was just curious about this, um, and what, yeah, really wanted to illustrate that it's not always the same. It's going to depend uh, on the implementation and maybe even the version that you're using. Yes. Oh. Uh, do people trust one source over the other in industry? Like, is are spacey stop words used more often than <coughs> scikit learns, or vice versa? Uh, that's a that's a good question. I'm not sure that there's yeah that there's a standard. And then I I, mean, I haven't used it, but I would imagine Gensim might have oh, has its own have it has its own as well. And I think I mean that's something also that's probably just important to note what you're doing so so people notice. Um, but again, as as people are moving towards more complex models, the uh, the use of stop words is falling out of favor. Although here um, in this notebook, we're going to be doing a pretty, uh, I mean, it's a simpler, simpler model, SVD, so we will use stop word. Well, we will re remove stop words. Thank you. Any other questions about stop words? Okay, and so then just um, as I mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier, um, in <laughs> In uh, more complex models, and in particular in deep learning, this could hurt your performance uh, because they are they are ways of throwing away information. Um, although that's you know can be useful when you have a simpler model and are not able to to capture that complexity. And then another approach um, that I have not had a chance to try, uh, but that I have heard uh, great things about and am interested in, is sentence piece um, or these. Uh, I think there's some other techniques for forming subword tokens. Um, and so instead of, we'll talk about tokenization in a moment, um, to, we're going to typically be thinking of our words as our units. Um, and sentence piece thinks about subword units. Um, so that's, that could be something to look into, or even something, yeah, to try using in uh, the project you do for your blog post. Okay, so going back to the, the problem at hand of topic modeling, uh, looking at this collection of postings that we have on uh, computer graphics, space, uh, atheism, and religion. Uh, so we're going to be using, today we'll be using um, scikit-learn's count vectorizer, um, although in the future we'll kind of uh, dig more into how you would uh, create tokens on your own or, or do this sort of work on your own. Let me run these. So, uh, we're creating uh, creating vectors. Uh, we have the shape of uh, 2034 by uh, 26,576. Here, the 2,000 is the different um, the different postings. So those are, you know, separate. I guess the modern equivalent you could think of posting on Reddit or another uh, kind of discussion site. Uh, so we have, you know, the 2,000 different postings, and then we have 26,000 um, words or tokens. Um, we can look at our vocab. So uh, vectorizer has this get feature names. And this is a list of words. Uh, so here I was looking at words uh, 7,000 to 7,020. You can see they're in alphabetical, art, um, alphabetical order. Uh, we kind of have all these words that start with CO. And I think, um, actually, before I go on to, well, yeah, before I go on to using SVD, I'm going to show you uh, what this looks like in a Excel spreadsheet because I think this can be a more visual way of seeing uh, seeing what's happening. And so, um, and this uh, the spreadsheet is in the the GitHub repo. Um, so here I'm looking at um, kind of just a very small data set because I wanted to be able to put it into to a spreadsheet. Uh, but 27 British novels with just 64 uh, vocabulary words, not, uh, 
they had 55,000 vocabulary words altogether, but we're just considering 64 of them. Um, and they, uh, I kind of did the, I did the work for this in a, uh, in a Python notebook, and then I extracted it just so you could visually see, like, what, what does this look like? Uh, so here is the term document matrix. So along the side, these are the different novels, and it's the author's name and then the start of the, uh, the title. So this is Jane Austen, Sense and Sensi Sensibility, uh, Charles Dickens, Bleak House. And then along here, we have the, the vocabulary words we're looking at in this case. Um, and they've been uh, normalized uh, using an approach called TF-IDF, which I'll talk about in a moment. But that just takes, in, takes into account uh, kind of how many words are in each document and how, uh, uh, how rare those words are. So you'll see Kathy does not show up in most of these books. It does show up in uh, Wuthering Heights, uh, where, where Kathy is one of the main characters. And so this is this is how you are uh, or how we are rep rep uh, representing this collection of novels uh, using the vocabulary words. And so I'm going to show you what SVD gives you. Um, SVD, this smaller so you can see more. Um, it's going to give you three matrices back. Um, so U is going to be the documents by the topics. S, uh, these are called the singular values, uh, but they are basically telling you kind of the importance or scale of each topic. You'll notice that S is a diagonal matri matrix, so it has non-diagonal values, uh, or sorry, non-zero values down the diagonal, everything else is zero. And then V relates topics to the vocabulary words. Um, and so you can kind of look through, actually I guess I should check, does anyone have a, a favorite book among this collection that they they want to look at. Okay, so I was I was scrolling through um, yesterday just when I was preparing. Um, I think I was looking at the end of the list and I noticed that Uncle uh, was largest. Let me see. Yeah, Uncle's largest here in. I guess this must be topic uh, topic five, yeah. So then we can come over here and see, okay, topic five. And I saw, oh, um, Stern Tristram has a high, relatively high number, 0.47 for it. And I actually was not familiar with this book, so I had to look it up. And let me, let me pull that up. But yeah. So it's the life and opinions of Tristram Shandley, a uh, gentleman, and it turns out that one of the main characters is the uncle. Um, so that that at least fits with, let me find it. Here it is, yeah. Uh, apart from Tristram as narrator, the most familiar and important characters in the book include his uncle Toby. Um, and actually, we could go back and let's see if Toby is a... Let's see if Toby's one of the vocabulary words. May not have made the, made the cut off. Okay, yeah, so Toby's in here. Toby is largest for topic five again. So topic five involves uncle and Toby. <laughs> and when we go over one of the books that has a lot of topic five in it is um, The Life and Times, uh, I've already forgotten the name, Tristram Shandy. Any questions about this? Well, so we'll see this from the kind of the Python point of view, but I think there can be something nice about the visual and of where we're going, and kind of what these topics look like. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Could you just briefly like explain again what each matrix are and how we got them? Sure. So I, um, yeah, I have not told you how we got them yet. Uh, so I kind of cheated. <laughs> Wanted you to see where we were going. Uh, that's a, a fair question. So these uh, these matrices are the result of SVD. 
Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know what they are first, uh, so you know that kind of what we're producing. And the first one is a matrix that is documents by topics. The middle one, and we'll talk, a, um, okay, I'll kind of do the spoiler as well. The, <coughs> the columns of this matrix are orthonormal to each other, uh, which I haven't, haven't showed you yet. Um, does anyone, anyone remember what it means for vectors to be orthonormal, a set of vectors? Oh, yeah, so I see, oh, was that a hand? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, wait. <laughs> <laughs> wait this, um, I'm not going to be able to get it all the way back there. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I believe that, oh. oh, it's recording, huh? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I believe that uh, orthonormal vectors, um, they're orthogonal to each other, and yeah. also their magnitude is one. That's right, their magnitude's one, they're orthogonal to each other. What does it mean to be orthogonal? Uh, 90 degrees. Yeah, 90 degrees. Um, and so I, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I saw several people kind of doing this hand sim, uh, signal. Um, yeah, they're, uh, they're perpendicular to each other, which means their dot product, um, uh, so for the set, uh, Two different vectors are going to have a dot product of zero together, um, and dotting one with itself will have a dot product of one, uh, which is why it has magnitude one. Um, so these uh, these different uh, topics are orthogonal to each other. These uh, columns. Then we've got uh, this matrix in the middle, uh, where these are called the singular values, and there are going to be uh, positive numbers, uh, and then everything that's not on the diagonal is zero. And then over here, we have our matrix V that is topics by vocabulary words or tokens. And here, the rows are orthonormal to each other. So let's go back to the, the notebook. Sorry, oops. Okay, so Gilbert Strang, who's the author of a classic uh, linear algebra textbook, said SVD is not nearly as famous as it should be. Um, SVD is a super, super useful uh, matrix decomposition that shows up a lot of places. And the SVD algorithm factor factorizes a matrix into one matrix with orthogonal columns, one with orthogonal rows, and a diagonal matrix that contains the relative importance of uh, each factor. SVD is an exact decomposition. Since the, the matrices it creates are big enough to fully cover the original matrix, um, and it's widely, widely used in linear algebra, including for semantic analysis, so what we're doing here with the, the topic modeling, uh, collaborative filtering or recommendations. Um, so we can see this in things like the Netflix Prize, where it, you know, used in a more complicated way, uh, but as a component. Calculating pseudo inverses for matrices that don't have a true inverse. Uh, data compression or PCA. Sorry, and I should correct this. We will not be covering PCA in here. So we're gonna use uh, scikit-learn's implementation of SVD today. So we give it uh, vectors, which perhaps is a confusing name. Uh, this was the, the term document matrix that we had gotten for, uh, for our documents. We wanna say full matrices equals false. Otherwise, uh, what it does is we'll come up with extra, extra columns for U and extra rows for V uh, to fully make an orthonormal basis. Uh, but we're, we're kind of never going to do that. Uh, so we run this and we get, oh, let me, sorry, hide the answer. Uh, we get back uh, three matrices, U, S, and V. 
<clears throat> and then I want um, I want you to uh, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> I want you now to take a moment to do this exercise and confirm that the decomposition uh, is the is the input. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll show this one. Um, so what you want to do is multiply the matrices together. Uh, I called that reconstructed vectors as U. Um, so did you see that S, uh, S showed up as a vector, even though the middle, the middle matrix is a matrix? So this is probably the, maybe the trickiest part about this. And actually, and show this above. Uh, well, you can see with S's shape, you know, that it's 2034, comma, meaning it's just this one-dimensional vector. Um, so NumPy has the dot diag, and that turns, it, it's neat. It, um, if you put uh, a 1D array into it, it'll make it into a matrix. And if you put a matrix into it, it'll pull off the diagonal and give you back the, the 1D array. Actually, let me, um, I guess, show you that on maybe a smaller. So let's just use like the first uh, five entries of S. Oh. All right, these are parentheses. I'm going to do just the four so it fits on a line. Okay, so here we were giving it, actually let's print this out. So we've got this 1D array with four numbers. If we put that into np.diag, we get back a four by four matrix where it's added zeros. And then if we apply np.diag to that again, It'll give us back just what was on the di um, on the diagonal. So that's a it can be a handy um, handy NumPy function. So we need to do that um, to do this multiplication. U times the matrix form of S times V, and then I prefer uh, I think do, using uh, NumPy's dot all close uh, to to check. Uh, the reconstructed vectors and the vectors. Um, alternately, you could look at the norm of the difference of the two and see that it's zero. Any questions about this? Okay. Um, so next, I want you to confirm that U and V are orthonormal. we just had why do we um, subtract oh uh, so you don't need to this is a alternate way of doing it oh so either of those yeah sorry let me put that maybe separately yeah good question and in the alternate way you would be um, checking that that difference was zero Just take the dot product of U with the transpose of U, and same thing for VH. That's right. And well, actually, and I should you say, and what are you looking for? Matrix of ones. Yes. Yeah. So take the the dot product. Whoa! <laughs> are you okay? I'm fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty padded. <laughs> Um, so yes, the take the transpose of, of u, uh, multiply it by u, um, and here I've checked that it's um, 
all close to the identity matrix of the same shape. Ditto for V and V transpose. Um, and the thing here is you do want to check that you're um, multiplying it on the correct side. So with U, it's the, yeah, it's the columns that are orthonormal. So you put the transpose first to get row, rows by columns. V, it's the rows that are orthonormal. So you have that and then times the transpose to have the columns. Any questions? Okay, and I think it's always just nice to check these things because um, you know you can know the definition of SVD that this is what it does, uh, but I feel like this kind of can make it a little more, a little more tangible of like okay, it really is giving me a matrix that's orthonormal, and I really am getting back my original from it. <clears throat> and so let's uh, let's see what can we say about the singular values. So here I've plotted the singular values, and again, remember the singular values, this is this 1D array that you can make into a matrix by adding zeros. Um, and I see that they are non-negative and they're decreasing. They're actually decreasing pretty quickly, it looks like. Um, and the, the kind of meaning behind the singular values is telling you the, um, the importance of the, the topics. I should also note the, the reason that our other dimension is topics is because we're doing topic modeling. Um, you could be doing SVD on a different application and assign that a different meaning. Like we're kind of the one setting the meaning of, uh, of that new dimension that we're adding and saying that it's topics. Um, so here I wanted to see what are the topics. Um, and so I wrote a method that uh, that goes through the um, the vocab and is choosing the the largest uh, the largest values to be the the top words uh, for each topic um, because really each topic actually let me go back to the Excel spreadsheet I think you can see it better here like each topic involves a little bit of every single word in the vocabulary right. And so to get something meaningful out of this, I said, you know, I'll check, uh, choose out what are the, the few words with the highest values here um, and assign those to be the words for the topic. And so that's, uh, that's what this method is doing. I'm calling those the topic words and then I'm, I'm looking at them. Uh, the, first, the first one is pretty weird. <laughs> this, uh, uh, citrus ditto propagandist surname galactocentric kindergarten surreal imaginative um, that doesn't that doesn't seem to to map to a topic um, but the next one JPEG gif file color quality image uh, format what topic do you think that is graphics, graphics yeah uh, then we've got what looks like another graphics one um, mm -hmm. What's that? Because um, it's got graphic, um, EDU, pub, and mail are less meaningful, but the 3D, Ray, FTP. Uh, then we've got Jesus, God, Matthew, people, atheist, atheism. Um, there, is, there is graphics in that last one, but overall this seems like probably a religion one or an atheism one. Uh, another, another graphics one another atheism or religion one. Here we've got a space one, uh, space, NASA, lunar, Mars, missions, probe. Um, actually, that's two space ones in a row. And so note that we're not, uh, you know, we're not getting kind of definitive topics that uh, exactly match what we, what we thought the topics were of our source data. Uh, but this is, these are sensical uh, outputs. Are there questions about this? So this also highlights that even though we kind of, you know, we were constructing, I would say, the somewhat artificial data set that we were hoping would have, you know, for clusters, we uh, wanted to look at more than four. We didn't just look at like the first four topics that we got because you can have some duplicates. And so here, uh, 
Well, really, I guess we got a few graphics ones uh, before, you know, we didn't get space until, what is that topic? The seventh and eighth most important topics. Yes? If you decrease the number of oh, wait, clusters to four, would they be more precise? Oh, well, so this, <laughs> actually, I was getting ahead of myself a bit. So here we've actually gotten 2,000 topics. And I was just looking at the top, uh, the top ten, um, and we'll we'll get to this later. How you can do a truncated SVD um, for SVD, you're basically kind of always imagining there are two thousand topics, but your question will be very relevant uh, when we talk about NMF. Yeah, so that's actually a good, uh, good tie-in tie to, to start talking about NMF. And so NMF is a different matrix factorization. So in practice, uh, if you're doing a topic modeling problem, you would either use SVD or you would use NMF. Um, I'm just showing both to kind of illustrate some of their properties and differences. The motivation for NMF is kind of wondering, okay, what do negative values mean in a lot of contexts? And even, oops, you know, even here, when we look at our words, what does it mean that, let me find a good negative, like topic seven refers to negative 0.29 atoms. How do we interpret that? Um, and so a lot of people like NMF for its interpretability um, of not having not having negatives, as the as the name suggests. And so here, this is looking at an image problem of decomposing faces into different components. Um, and th this is also something that you know earlier I was saying we're calling these components topics because we're doing topic modeling. If we were using SVD on face images, we would call our different components that we got, I guess, like different components of the face or different pieces of the face. Um, and so this, uh, this would be something uh, kind of more akin to what you could get from SVD, whereas with NMF, uh, because it's non-negative, it's like, oh, I can see how these are pieces of faces. Um, so here, you know, here's kind of like underneath someone's eyes. This is the right side of someone's nose and um, kind of around the mouth. Um, so NMF by giving you non-negatives. So what we liked about SVD uh, decomposition is that the resulting matri matrices are um, orthogonal. <coughs> um, NMF, we're saying let's make them, let's constrain them to be non-negative. And so our data set V is going to be a product of just two matrices here, W and H, uh, both that have non-negative entries. And so here they're showing a factorization of V where these are actual faces. And so each face has been um, kind of unwound, you know, to be a single array of um, pixel information. And they're representing that as facial features by the importance of the features in each image. And you can think of these. Uh, so matrix, uh, matrix multiplication, actually this might be a good time to say a little bit about matrix multiplication. Uh, matrix multiplication, one way to think about it is taking linear combinations so typically, um, you know, a lot of people, when you talk about matrix multiplication, you might think of a song, row by column, row by column. Um, <laughs> I meant to look up the, the lyrics before this. Um, I think it's multiply them, add them up one by one. Uh, but there's an alternate way to think about matrix multiplication, which is thinking about the columns of what you have first. And then, actually, I should have... Look at these names. Okay. So 
So say you have a column called A, B, C, and D. Um, if you were multiplying that just by W, X, Y, Z, really that's like taking this linear combination of W times column A plus X times column B plus Y times column C, and then I've run out of space. plus z times column d. And so, and then that, the result of this is going to give you a column. Um, and so this, um, a lot of, I think a lot of real world applications, this is actually kind of the meaning of what's going on with matrix uh, multiplication, even though it's often not taught this way. Um, but if you're doing, so this was a matrix times a vector, if you were doing a matrix times a matrix, what you're doing is taking a bunch of different linear combinations of the first matrix, where each column in your second matrix gives you the coefficients that you're using for this linear combination. Are there any questions about this interpretation of matrix multiplication? Okay, so this is, yeah, I think this is pretty useful and not, not talked about enough in linear algebra. And so that's what, well, that's what's going on here in this picture is you have these facial features and then you're taking a bunch of different linear combinations of facial features to reconstruct your original faces. Uh, things to note about um, NMF is that it's non-unique. Non so SVD is giving you a unique decomposition, NMF does not. Uh, here I list several uh, several applications, uh, collaborative filtering, face decompositions, audio source separation, um, chemistry, bioinformatics. Um, but going back to NLP and our topic at hand, uh, if we were looking at, I should note this is transposed from a lot of the matrix, how the matrix is in Excel, uh, where it's words by documents, then this is giving us topics and topic importance indicators. We're going to use uh, scikit-learn's uh, implementation of NMF, and here we have to set the number of topics. So that's setting the number of clusters that, that we expect or we think we might have. And so this is kind of a hyperparameter that you're having to guess at and that you might want to try different things with. Uh, so we'll use, uh, use decomp, yes? Oh, wait, let me give you. So you said uh, number of topics. I'll hold it a, a little bit closer to your mouth. So you said ha number of topics is a hyperparameter. Yes. So how do you, how do you, do you have a metric or a graph that you can evaluate the, the what number of topics is good for this? Um, I mean, this is hard because it's an unsupervised problem. Like, we don't have, um, usually you don't have a ground truth of what the, what the true topics are. Um, so in this case, we don't know. Like, it, like, it, like, in practice, if you were working on this type of problem, I think you would want to do some exploratory data analysis to see, like, how many topics does this look like to me? Try it and see, like, do these topics seem reasonable together? Thanks. Happy, you're welcome. Yeah, I mean, I think there is something a little bit um, dissatisfying about the fact that you're kind of having to having to set this. Um, so here, I've run uh, run the decomposition. Well, so I created a decomposition, fit the transform to vectors, which is our term document matrix from before, and then. Uh, that returns the first matrix, W, and then <coughs> this is how you access the second matrix, H. And here, I'm applying show topics on H, and this is what I get back. 
And what do you what do you think of these topics? I thought they were I thought they were pretty good. Um, we've got computer images. This is actually very similar to one of the ones that showed up in SVD, the second one. Uh, third is space, either religion or atheism, then other computer graphics. We might want to rerun this with more topics. Something to note is my show topics method, um, remember, is only showing, and this is the method that I wrote, the end of the SVD section up here. Um, I've, I've manually chosen the number of topic words uh, because, kind of same with SVD, you can have a value for every single word, you know, which in this case is 25,000 words, but many of those are going to be zero or close to zero uh, for NMF, and so here I'm just choosing the, the eight largest to display as the topic words. And then we can see this in Excel, so I had the SVD, then I also did NMF on this collection of British novels. Here I did uh, 10 topics for them. Um, I mean, something that uh, I guess is nice is if you have lots of zeros, it's sparser. So like here, Kathy only shows up, or sorry, Yes, yeah, so sometimes the words are only showing up in one of the topics. Um, and then we could go back and check. Let's see, so Kathy is in topic six. We would expect uh, Wuthering Heights to have a fair amount of topic six, since Kathy's one of the main characters, and it does. It's uh, 0.79. And so this is kind of how you can look at it again. And we've got just two matrices here. Any questions about this? And let me. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'll repeat the question. How did you get this file? How did I get the Excel file? Um, so I, I cheated and I, I did this work in, um, in, a, uh, in an IPython notebook. Uh, so I did this in Python. And then I think I saved them as CSVs, maybe, the, the matrices so that I could copy them into an Excel file. Yeah, so I don't think I saved that. Sorry, this is from a few years ago. Yeah, I kind of did it as scratch work. But I encourage you to try recreating it, because I, um, I link to the data source here, so you can kind of download the, the British novel data. Um, oh, no, I do have the Python code, yeah. And I link to the Python code. Okay, so yeah, it is uh, it is available. This is in this is from the numerical linear algebra class. Um, but so the the Excel file is in the GitHub repo for this class, and then it's got the information on how you can you can recreate this. Uh, but here, I really uh, primarily just wanted to give you a way to visualize. Okay, what do these factorizations look like? Because um, I think when you're just reading the equations, they can sound more complicated. And then when you see it, it's like, okay, these are just matrices of numbers. Any other questions about this? Okay, so let's go back to back to the Jupyter notebook. Um, yeah, so next I was going to talk about TF-IDF, uh, which is topic frequency inverse document frequency, and it's a way to normalize term counts uh, by taking into account how often they appear in a document, how long the document is, and how common or rare the term is. Um, so if there's a term that's extremely rare, it's more important. Um, if a document's super long, it kind of means less for each topic that appears in it, because you can assume a, a really long document just has more content in general. I'm going to use uh, scikit-learn's TF-IDF vectorizer. Uh, this is just another way of kind of processing our data. And so again, it's this news group training data from, from before that we had. And then here are the, uh, the topics I get this time for, for NMF. Um, yeah, and here the, the fourth one is pretty weird. 
Uh, but the other, I think the other four are pretty good. And something to note about NMF is that it is not exact, um, so you may not get your original matrix back perfectly. And as I said before, it's also not unique. So NMF can be fast and easy to use. Um, it did take years of research and expertise to create. Um, also for NMF, the matrix needs to be at least as tall as it, as it is wide, or you'll get an error with the fit transform, but you can always just transpose your matrix uh, to get it in that format. So something that was nice about um, NMF is that we were only having to calculate a few topics. And SVD, we were calculating 2,000 topics, right? Whereas most of those were not very meaningful. Um, and we kind of would like that benefit for SVD of not having to calculate so many topics. Um, and the way to do this is called truncated SVD. Uh, we're really just interested in the vectors corresponding to the largest singular values. Um, and so this, uh, there's a nice uh, Facebook research had a nice post on fast randomized SVD. Um, so some shortcomings of class, classical algorithms for decomposition are that uh, matrices are often, uh, quote, stupendously big. This is from a nice paper. Uh, let me open this. Um, about uh, probabilistic algorithms for matrix decomp decompositions. Um, data is also missing or inaccurate in the real world, and it's kind of why you use a ton of computational resources when you know that your input was somewhat imprecise. And so there's, a, you know, there's not a there's not a big benefit to being very precise with your calculation if your input data is not that precise. Um, data transfer now plays a major time uh, in algorithms, and so this is moving. Uh, moving data from disk memory to, uh, you know, registers or cache, moving it to the GPU if you're doing GPU uh, computations, uh, but moving data around can be uh, time consume or, yeah, very time consuming. <clears throat> and so randomized algorithms are a great, great solution to this. Uh, they're stable. Uh, the performance guarantees often don't depend on kind of these properties of the underlying matrices um, that can be done in parallel. And so we're just going to look at randomized SVD as one example of a, a randomized um, algorithm. And it's going to kind of let us get some of these benefits for SVD that we saw of NMF of, you know, we only had to calculate five topics for NMF um, if that's the number we chose. Whereas with the original SVD, we were throwing away a ton of data by only looking at you know, a few singular values and a few topics. So um, I have a timing comparison of um, doing NumPy's uh, linear algebra SVD that we did before. And it took me four seconds, which is Kind of, kind of slow, particularly we only had 2,000 documents here, uh, which is, I mean, depending on what you're doing, you could be doing something much larger. Then I used um, sklearn's implementation of randomized SVD, and it was three seconds, so that's a nice, I mean, it's a 25% speed up. And then I used a uh, randomized SPD from Facebook's library, FBPCA, and that was just one second, so that's significantly faster. Um, so that's neat that it's a lot faster. I should note here I'm having to input uh, how, many, how many singular values I want to calculate, which is going to map to, you're going to have the same number of columns of U and rows of V. Uh, it's going to correspond to your numbers of singular values which is you know, necessary for this matrix multiplication of u times s times v to, to work. Um, so I chose 10. If I had chosen more, this would, be, would take longer. Um, 
yeah, and that's uh, the end of this notebook. I'm going to talk more about this, uh, some more about this next time, because I know this was probably a little bit quick. Um, are there any, any final questions for today, though? Yes, Quinn? And Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, with the, yeah, with the randomized SVD, is there still a way to determine the number of principal components based on like the amount of explained variance that you're covering, or because it's like randomized, do you lose some of that? Or is um, we, the explained variance. Of, yeah, like like of, determining like how many like um, vectors you want based on like how much variance is explained by like. The um. Well, I, I so. The singular values, I think, give you that in terms of because the singular values, they're kind of telling you the magnitude, particularly since U and V are, um, you know, have orthogonal rows and orthogonal columns. Uh, that means that like each, uh, you know, the pieces of U and V are just one, and so all the magnitude is coming from the singular values. Um, so yeah, you can look at yeah, I think smaller singular values, and and there are techniques for uh, looking at also like the ratio between the singular values of yeah of subsequent ones. So that's a good question. Any yeah, other questions? Okay, we're about at. Thank you. Uh, we're about at 1 o'clock, but yeah, feel free to email me if you have further questions, and I will review this um, on Thursday uh, at the start of class before we go on to the, the next application. Well, oh, thanks.